Mitt Romney's sort of retirement victory lap. You know, like he he announced over the weekend that <laughs> wait, 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 which victories? Uh, no, no, no. What, what exactly, is the Romney no. uh, uh, trophy chest filled with? Well, I mean, th- this is my point. His victory is retiring now. And his victory is in his video where he announces that he will not seek reelection. He just says it's because I'm too old. And it's clearly like, you know, like a, a, a pointed barb at both Biden and Trump. But I love the troll of Mitt Romney, who is the handsomest and healthiest 80 year old man on the planet. Just saying, sorry, can't serve in office anymore. I'm simply too old and infirm. You know, yeah. he's stunting on him and, you know, good on him for that. But like what I, what I say, like his, his victory retirement lap is that like he now gets to like um, sort of bow out as a statesman and sort of have his version of events be yeah. sort of chiseled into the tablet of his career. You know what I mean? Yes. And, 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 and mainly uh, this takes a form of a McKay Coppins piece um, and then uh, which is an excerpt from a book coming out. It's titled What Mitt Romney Saw in the Senate. And, you know, like it, it's about his his horror at like, you know, the, most of my party doesn't even believe in the Constitution anymore. And it's just a way to him to, like I said, like shank Biden and the Democrats who were so very mean to him when he ran for president mm, yes. and also like make a stance for kind of like, you know, the the sensible, you know, uh, constitutional style Republican as uh, as opposed to like the, you know, the, the barking hordes of MAGA Republicans who view him as a traitor. Now, uh, I, I think I thought this was best summed up by uh, that guy, uh, you know, that guy Noah Blum. Yeah. A, yeah, real Love shithead. No, no Blumkin. The films that come out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful stuff. <laughs> As I said, he's, he writes here, uh, the way Romney was treated 100% set the stage for Republicans to want something like Trump. And y'all better come to terms with it. Felix, y'all once again, fuck he, off. Even, the, even the neoconservatives are getting soy now. It's yeah, just, soy is everywhere. Soy yeah. is universal. It's like coral from uh, Armored Core 6. It <laughs> penetrates all. Uh it, I have to say, like, if you're Mitt Romney and you want, like, you know, you want it to be normal time again, your best hope would be like a Biden 2008 or better style blowout against Trump. That's really that's the only thing you can be like. It has to be seven points or greater. It has Mm -hmm. to Biden has to win in 2024 by that much or you're just you're not going to get to be normal again. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Yeah, that's for sure. They need to. They need a, just a huge up, just a massive repudiation. And I don't know yeah. if uh, I don't know if old Joe's got it in him, frankly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's just say a lot would need to happen. Yeah, wouldn't it? But you know, like by sort of creating for himself this kind of uh, self-authored moment of statesmanlike humility and, and bowing out with grace. Like I said, he his reward for that is he sort of gets to like write his own story about his career, which you know. Before before I dive into the uh, McKay Coppins piece um, in the Atlantic, I just want to say that like, d- despite the way uh, like he sort of talked about mostly among Democrats now, Mitt Romney's career in the private sector was just it was a thousand times more destructive to like American lives than anything Donald Trump ever did with his chintzy real estate scams and like naming licensing rights and shit like that. It's a per it, like that that dichotomy is just a perfect illustration of how of how these people are able to mystify themselves because Mitt Romney now has through this narrative convinced himself well you know this Trump stuff's bad but it's not because of my party or my worldview it's because the Democrats were too unfair to me when I ran for president because I'm a good guy and I'm not like this guy but they treated me like a bad guy meanwhile he is actually responsible for Trump but not because the Democrats were mean to him but because he was one of the corporate pirates of a class of people who systematically dismantled the manufacturing economies of the Midwestern states that Trump won in 2026, 2016. (laughs) Yeah. So he is literally responsible for it because he lives in the fantasy land of politics. He gets to tell himself, you know, it did come down to me, but it came down to Democrats being so mean to me. Unlike everybody else in every other presidential election in history, like what the fuck do you think running an an election is? You, are very mean to the other side. You try to scare people into voting against them. That's what's always been. Damn Republicans don't do that. Yeah, you you guys, yeah, yeah. They, they said that John Kerry gave himself a bump like a pro wrestler. <laughs> you know, like this is, yeah, yeah. and they were right. They were right to. It's They're politics. The little, the little purple hearts at the convention, you crying bitch. Yeah, it's politics, you know, grow yeah. up. But yeah, Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney was strip mining you know, medium sized companies three at a time for what? 
we ask, it turns out, to eat demonious exile meals of frozen salmon on hamburger buns while watching sub prestige TV alone. You <laughs> That's have the real. He has like a billion yeah. dollars. What that the is fuck? the just bone chilling part about it is that he did this. He is one of the people whose blood's on his hands for the republic that he thinks he loves. And this is the 30 pieces of silver he got. Yeah. Duke Cunningham had a boat. You He's know, got, <laughs> the Duke. He's sure. living like Marty yeah. Hart after the divorce. <laughs> yeah. If I was Mitt Romney, dollars. if I was Mitt Romney, and I'm doing like the Macbeth thing of like, look, I'm already going to hell. Like, I already, I did all this shit. I, but I have like a billion dollars. I have this body unpoisoned by vaping or alcohol or anything. What am I doing with my billion dollars? Um, I'm getting two drifters to fight each other in my living room. I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, doing stuff like that. I'm playing the most dangerous game. I'm not watching Ted Lasso eating a misery salmon meal <laughs> yes. and scrolling, I, scrolling online oh like every other God. loser. You could do that on like sub minimum wage, man. You need to destroy the lives of millions of people so you can live the way that it, like a depressed middle manager does. It's really, it's really, really bad. I mean, all the other private equity guys, uh, like Henry Kravis from Barbarians at the Gate, they live in the coolest places ever. Are these guys bad? Yes, they're some of the worst Americans the last 50 years. But Henry Kravis lives in a three-story apartment with a swimming pool. In, not in the building, like in his unit. <laughs> in unit pretty, swimming pool, yeah. yeah well, pretty cool. <laughs> Pretty cool Listen, stuff. What you're talking about, I think, sort of gets to the heart of Mitt Romney, like as a national figure, and like the the way, for, like for the for whom, like for the people for whom he represents, this kind of like uh, the the road not taken for republic, like a sort of constitutional moderate Republican statesman to like you know shepherd our country. And the way that he was never and never really got over, despite the fact that on paper every like he was a popular governor of a democratic state, you know, like. Obamacare was his health care plan. He got the Olympics to Salt Lake City record of success in business, popular in both Utah and Massachusetts in his in his uh, holding political office. But here's the thing we've talked about it before. And I, and I alluded to this in his trolling of Trump and Biden for being like, I'm too old. Like, if you had told me Mitt Romney is 80, I'd be like, you're lying. Get the fuck out of here. He right. Looks, if he looks 50 years old and like it's an advertisement, him and his gorgeous huge family it's an advertisement for the church of latter-day saints but here's the thing mm -hmm. we talked about it many times before on the show mormons and mitt romney himself is too american for america when mm -hmm. we when yes. we are, when we in, when we encounter someone who looks like the president in a movie and behaves like it or is just is more american than we are it it frightens who the fuck are you us. what's this we don't we don't relate Think to better him. than me yeah, we do yeah, not it's, relate it's to the that. Original, original reason why Homer hates Ned Flanders. <laughs> yes. Buenos dias, neighboritos. The handle's Flanders, but my friends call me Ned. Hi, Flanders. We, I mean, Biden polls bad, sure. He underperformed in his last election, but people are more, way more comfortable with the idea of Biden as president than ever anyone like Mitt Romney. You and, know? You know, what, yeah, you can't imagine what's going on in his mind. The only actual like actual bigotry that prevented Mitt Romney from getting the, getting becoming the Republican president of the United States is from evangelical Christians who regard <laughs> Mormons as a you know wildly heretical blasphemers. Like, I mean, I don't, which, I don't we, give a we, shit. Which, I don't give a shit one way yeah. or another. Which it is, but like, what do you yeah, think? But evangelical it's, that's not, that's not, shit that's, that's is. no sweat off my nose. No, yeah. It's the perfection of American Christianity. It is yeah. that shit from the evangelicals is just hater fuel. That is just oh, hater yeah. aid. You got blown. You got beat. Joseph Smith. He had a little bit of a step on you, and he perfected American Un undrafted, you dumbasses undrafted. were hooting on jugs and giving yourself strychnine poisoning. Joseph Smith went. Well, he went to. He was, he was from a, a Big East conference school. No football there at all. Undrafted comes into the league of major American religions. Blows everyone out of the water. Evangelicals are fucking. They're broke. They want to mm -hmm. be ballers divorced multiple times. Yeah, they suck. What if we, we've said it a million times. Mormons are everything they pretend to be. Indeed. The, evangelicals have to do this like um, subterfuge where they draw Jesus in increasingly like whiter shades to make him look more and more American. 
Uh, Mormons are like, no, he was American. He, he was American. Here. He came Look at his here. passport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's called going for it. Yeah. They didn't give a fuck. And, and they, they paid. It's like, I'm sorry. You guys couldn't handle being Mormon. You could not stand up to the rigors of it. So go, just go to your mega church. Yeah. No. And no evangelical could handle the pressure of being a God on a planet. Oh my God. Can you imagine being, running, running their own planet? They can't even run Liberty university. <laughs> <laughs> but just uh, just a little bit from the uh, Atlantic article, because like in in addition to his mind of Jason fail meals, uh, there's some pretty pretty good color about Mitt Romney, including this first paragraph. For most of his life, Mitt Romney has nursed a morbid fascination with his own death, suspecting that it might assert itself one day suddenly and violently. I mean, like, bro, Dude, you, you've won. Kind of You're in your is. 80s and could probably run a marathon tomorrow. Like, just. Forget about it, dude. Just take a load off. Like, it, it doesn't matter. But he says he controls what he can, of course. He wears his seatbelt and diligently applies sunscreen and stays away from secondhand smoke. For decades, he's followed his doctor's recipe for longevity with monastic dedication. The lean meats, the low-dose aspirin, the daily 30-minute se sessions on the stationary bike, heartbeat at 140 or higher, it doesn't count. He would live to be 120 if he could. So much is going to happen, he says, when asked about this particular desire. I want to be around to see it. That's ominous. <laughs> but some part of him has always <laughs> doubted that he'll get anywhere close. <laughs> yes. The great eye will open. <laughs> uh, but listen when to a this. guy like that says it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Project Arcturus will be culminating. <laughs> <laughs> we're 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 finally going to divide the uh, the sectors of America into di into different corridors. We're going <laughs> to elect that we're going to elect the flesh emperors. <laughs> I'm hearing that our red heifer research department is getting really close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, listen to this he says he has never really interrogated the cause of this preoccupation but premonitions of death seem to follow him once years ago he boarded an airplane for a business trip to london and a flight attendant whom he'd never met saw him gasp and rushed from the cabin in horror when she was asked, <laughs> listen to this listen to this felix when when she when she was asked what had so upset her she confessed that she dreamt the night before about a man who looked like him, exactly like him, getting shot and killed at a rally in Hyde Park. He didn't know how to respond other than to laugh and put it out of his mind. But when a few days later he happened to find himself on the park's edge and saw a crowd forming, he made a point not to linger. Can you imagine how happy would he would have been if he had been in the Capitol on January 6th oh and my got like, God. pulled apart? Like the captain in uh, Day of the Dead. <laughs> Choke on him! Choke on him! It would have been like uh, in the last season of The Shield when Shane Vendrell is like suicidal. Yeah. And he's, he's like trying yes. to die as a hero all those times, all those great scenes. And then he just, he gets to be, he gets to be just shredded by, by his fellow Republicans. Yeah. I, I do. Okay. The ultimate martyr. I have said I do have a similar thing to this, honestly, mm. like a little bit. I oh, had I'm, I'm a huge on hypochondriac, so I I absolutely get him on that. Oh, I'm not a, I'm not a hypochondriac at all. I'm kind of like the opposite. I feel like well, no, I mean, you either think you're going to die of a disease or something, or you think something's going to kill you. One right, another, you I, right. On it. I think it's the other thing like disease. I feel like if someone could tell me I have cancer and I could just sleep it off. I'd be fine. But like. I did have, I had like a dream, like a sleep paralysis thing more so when I was a kid that was like, basically told me I was going to die on a Tuesday. And ever since then, I have just, I've been terrified <laughs> of flying on Tuesdays. I've been afraid of like really doing wow. anything. And like, I have, you know, again, not a hypochondriac. I don't, I don't think any, like, I, I talked about this on Twitter, like, Jewish people can withstand heart attacks, leukemia, uh, being 80 years old. None of that bothers me. That's not scary to me. I just, I think it would be like a freak thing. Like a crazy person shoots me in the head or something like that. That's more kind of like Mitt. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like, I feel like for whatever reason, like it has in reality, what actually is that it's pretty, you know, it's the same thing that dreams always are. It's a jumble of the conscious and subconscious and it doesn't, a lot of the times it doesn't actually mean anything. And this one assuredly doesn't. But, you know, we assign special providence to these things. 
So I, I end up having the same thing as him. I will avoid, yeah, fly, being in an airplane on a Tuesday for that reason. I mean, that, that is, I mean, yeah, if, if, I had, if I had a dream that I remembered that vividly of, of some being telling me that I was civil going to die on a Tuesday, yeah, I would not be, I, yeah, I'd be not, I'm not going out uh, for Taco Tuesday. I'd be staying indoors on Tuesdays. This but, is um, probably tempting fate, but sometimes I do think like, well, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> so Day far, so happens. good. So far, yeah. so good. Now, um, Romney's premonition of death is used to set up an incident in which um, the main independent senator, Angus King, Angus King of his famous steakhouse, or delicious. rather not of his famous delicious steakhouse, which he should be running instead of whatever dumb bullshit he's up to. Um, basically, just about how Angus King relayed to him a message from uh, a general, I believe, one of the handsome generals about all the chatter pre-January 6th that they were hearing on social media about people arming themselves to come to D.C. to kill Mitch McConnell. And then Romney gets Mitch on the phone and is like, Mitch, have you heard about this? Like, I'm very concerned. Then Mitch is just like, new phone, who this? And like, basically, he tells Mitch McConnell and he's like, yeah, let me get back to you on that. And then just doesn't do anything. And then there's another part where like Mitch is talking shit about Donald Trump. And then, of course, he claims never to have said it, anything of the sort. But that, that, that's not the interesting part of this article. The interesting part of the article is this. In the dining room, a 98-inch TV went up on, a, on the wall and a leather recliner landed in front of it. Romney, who didn't have many real friends in Washington, ate mm. dinner alone there most nights, watching mm. Ted Lasso or Better Call Saul as he mm. leafed through briefing materials. On the day of my first visit, he showed me his freezer, which was full of salmon fillets that had been given to him by Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska. He didn't especially like salmon, but found that if he put it on a hamburger bun and smothered it in ketchup, it made for a serviceable uh. meal. <laughs> Sa salmon with ketchup on a hamburger bun. Well, I mean, you know, you can't let it go to waste. Mr. Like, Hot you dog personally meat. are responsible for probably hundreds of thousands of fentanyl deaths, and you're worried that you're going to waste Murkowski salmon. Just this is the definition of perversion. It does make me like Murkowski because it's like she knows no one wants to eat like that salmon. much salmon, but yeah. like she knows <laughs> yeah. that, and it's it feels like a bullying thing. Like she does that to anyone she wants to fuck with. Like, hey, dumbass, here's two hundred pounds of salmon. Enjoy trying to fit this in your apartment, fucko. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. But yeah, it actually surprised me for a guy how, as healthy as he is that he doesn't like salmon and that, like, you know, hot dog meat, famous well, hot dog favorite, meat is his favorite, his favorite meat. meats. Yeah. Salmon I gotta does. say, there is a salmon's little bit kind of news. ass. It, it's not yeah, really good. Salmon's just, good in certain contexts. I think the salmon is delicious. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. When you get it nice and the, the, the pieces just kind of fall apart, you, you make it sure that there's like, enough. Olive oil, some garlic, and lemon juice in there. Sounds like you should go to the Senate. You put maybe a uh, a yogurt based sauce. So like a like a teriyaki salmon, I think, or miso glazed salmon. Oh, yeah. it's delicious. And oh, if we're talking cedar planked and herb crusted, then get the <laughs> fuck out of here. This is a delicious these are not, meal. You people, they, are these are not planked salmons. This is this is frozen salmon that he's defrosting and putting ketchup on. He could do better than this I, and enjoy. It. He's it. a sicko. I'm sorry, he's a freak. But, this this calls this this calls to mind uh, the, the, the you know like a, a sense of memory of the famous Frank Luntz profile of him oh, eating yes. spag bowl as watching good as the it newsroom. gets for me as this is as good as it gets for me and it's just him like no friends just the, the image of him eating a salmon ketchup burger watching Ted Lasso on a Ooh. ninety eight inch screen uh, while half hearted no wonder he's trying to get out of this on it none of this what has the what fucking you, depressing Zana dude. It decreed a stately pleasure dome for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? This is the worst ruling class that has ever existed. JP Morgan drank yeah. so much that he had a cauliflower shaped growth coming out of his nose. <laughs> yeah, he was a something to look at. Yeah, he JP Morgan got pussy. He did all, all day, every day. Yeah. He had parties where he would eat like 85 oysters. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been this austere a member of the ruling class since John D. Rockefeller himself, the original sicko. It's true. And that's why he's got to be there signing laws and why he tried to be the guy killing people with like drone strikes and, and invasions because he needs that because that's how much of a pervert he is. Yeah. Because that is what draws politics. Perverts. I got to uh, say there's a little bit of news or at least not news. More just reminding us of something we all should know. That shit about him trying to warn Mitch about 
uh, January 6th in advance. It really does remind you that, like, it was not some surprise that these ho- these fucking ho- hoople heads are going to storm the palace. Like, they were all talking about it, and yeah. yet there were still like what, like a two rows of guys just kind of standing yeah. like assholes in yeah. front of the uh, the the Capitol. Somebody made a decision at some point to let this shit occur. I don't yeah. know if there's any way you can argue against that because look at what happened when they inaugurated the motherfucker. They had the entire national guard bayonets out on the fucking uh, lawn. They could have had that on January 6th. And these fucking pussies weren't going to do anything if that had happened. Yeah. I mean, like Mitt Romney hears it and takes it a, you know, a thousand percent literal, but you know, Mitch McConnell, that's why he never got back. He's like, yeah, sure. They're going to kill me. Who cares? You know, like he's like, oh, I love that. Thank they're going to wow. they're they're kill me and my wife. Yeah, sure, I, can fa- I, can, I can finally go to hell. I, I'm 500 years old at this point. I would love to die. <laughs> yeah. I actually, you think I'm a human. I am a, a mutant descendant of those 500 year old fucking tortoises. And I'm yearning for death. It, in Elden Ring, one of the big things is they took out the rune of death. And there's no more. There's no, like you can't die anymore unless like a magic guy kills you. And you're just so you're just condemned to like eternal shitty life. And I feel like that's what happened to him. Yeah, that's why he has those spells. He's waiting. He's, he thinks he sees them <laughs> like in the scrub. It's like, is that him? Is that the magic dude who's going to finally free me from this? And then oh shit, it's not good. <laughs> oh, uh, the the last thing I want to read from the uh, the McKay Coppins profile though is is this. Shortly after moving into his Senate office, Romney had hung a large rectangular map on the wall. First printed in 1931 by Rand McNally, the Histo map attempted to chart the rise and fall of the world's most powerful civilizations through 4,000 years of human history. When Romney first acquired the map, he saw it as a curiosity. After January 6th, he became obsessed with it. He showed me that he showed the map to visitors, brought it up in conversations and speeches. More than once, he found himself staring at it alone in his office at night. The Egyptian empire had reigned some 900 years before it was overtaken by the Assyrians. Then the Persians, the Romans, the Mongolians, the Turks, each civilization had its turn and eventually collapsed in on itself. Maybe the falls were inevitable, but what struck Romney the most about the map was how thoroughly it was dominated by tyrants of some kind, pharaohs, emperors, kaisers, kings. A man gets some people around him and begins to oppress and dominate others. He said the first time he showed me the map, it's a testosterone related phenomenon, perhaps. I don't know. But in the history of the world, that's what happens. America's experiment in self-rule is fighting against human nature. This is a very fragile thing, he told me. Authoritarianism is like the gargoyle lurking over the cathedral, ready to pounce. For the first Shut time up. in his life, for the first time in his life, he wasn't sure if the cathedral would hold. I just love the idea of him being uh, up until January 6th. He was just like, uh, check out this histo map. It's a cool thing in my office. And then after it, he's like staring at it, like, you know, with a over a, a snifter of chocolate milk or something, just going, <laughs> all civilizations <laughs> must crumble. All great men must fall. Here, behold, Ozymandias. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 reading some W. Cleon Skousen, everyone's <laughs> favorite Mormon uh, apocalyptic nutso who loved to talk <laughs> in those giant historical terms. The uh, West you know has fall. The West has fallen. Millions, billions must cry to Ted Lasso. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess the thing is like. First of all, like January 6th, that's your first indication that like the, 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 the gargoyle of authoritarianism stalks the battlements of American democracy. OK, sure. And then like and, and, and that's its first, you know, uh, you know, barrage across the across the bow is January 6th. But, you know, again, it's just like this is a guy who's been like a down the line Republican his entire fucking career. And now he's just like our civilization is about to crumble. You know, it'll stop it. Me resigning and setting an example for everyone. And you know what, though? Like, I, I think it's weird, like y- y- the Mormon thing, because you're thinking in terms of eternity. You look at like ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, you know, the Persian Empire. It's like, oh, they all were around for like, a, but like, you know, nine centuries and then fell. That's a good run. Who cares? Like, we're fucking ahead of the curve as far as that goes. And it's just sort of like, I, I don't get it also like existentially despairing about like the rise and fall of civilizations. It's just like, it's, well, it's because we of the way we it's because of the way we remember history. We remember history in these periods like the, uh, this empire, then it fell, this empire, then it fell. And then the gaps between is just this empty space. But although there tends to be less archaeological evidence, 
for those times, which is why we don't have as much of a, a thick historical narrative around them, people still obviously were living. We're living. People were obviously surviving. People were loving and 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 all the stuff we're doing. They were doing yeah. all that stuff. They just weren't making as strong a record of it because there wasn't the density of uh, of civilizational structures. But they weren't all gone. There were still this this social uh, fabric that persisted. And we can't because that since, since it looks like a black hole from the from the our position, we just assume that that's all there is is these this fall into a chasm. When in reality, it's people adjusting to changing conditions and evolving new social structures to deal with those conditions. It's the same thing that history always is. It's not the end of anything. It's the tra- continued transformation of one in more internal thing. Yeah, well, I think like, you know, it's with the Mormon thing. It's like you need to America needs to be eternal because if America falls, it's like the world ends. Yes. Yeah. I, but it also I mean, like, there's nothing I hate more than like the people who are the most comfortable of the most comfortable. Like, yeah. uh, I hate anyone who has the same job as me and is like, well, looks like we're all going to die from climate change or fucking whatever. And it's like, we, we, we don't even, we don't even have to answer the same emails as normal people. Do you think you're going to experience climate change in the same way that somebody from fucking Bangladesh will? But like, I just, the constant obsession with the world ending by people who are uniquely insulated from, you know, whether they are apocalyptic or just bad things happening, those types of events is incredibly frustrating. But it also does make me think like, OK, the world has ended a billion times before yeah. the world as people have known it has ended. I'm sure for people living, you know, from 1916 to 1919, it felt like the world was ending. And it was to an mm-hmm. extent. Yeah. They were witnessing horrors that are unparalleled uh, compared to anything that we in America, people who mostly listen to this show or, you know, have a computer job experience today. That's not to say that, like, everything is great, but truly truly cataclysmic like era ending things have happened and humanity doesn't just stop there are well, those yeah as matt said periods that aren't as rigorously recorded but periods of adjustment and the thing is though they're not scared that they're going to die during this stuff really what they're scared right. of is that they aren't going to die during this period because these periods are filled with horrifying turmoil mass death and not equally distributed mass death and the, the people who survive are changed by those, that experience and like their conceptions of morality and, and right and identity are broken and reformed by that process. And people who have fetishized their personal ego and identity as the only real thing in the universe clutch so hardly at it that the thought of losing it is worse than death. And so they would rather fantasize that they're going to personally die so they don't have to worry about going through that transformation than realize, oh, like for me and my children, things are going to be different. I'm going to have to value different things. And that is so terrifying when we're addicted to the, the, the meager pleasures that we've afforded ourselves now that, yeah, we'd much rather fantasize about a cataclysmic ending than reckon with the moral responsibility of continuing. I think even more terrifying to people, more terrifying to people who are on the more comfortable side is the idea that if you if you don't die and yes it's unevenly distributed and others are dying in your place then you have to grapple with what that means you you have to grapple with what your life means what does it mean that maybe in in as much as anyone deserves this when climate catastrophes happen at an increased rate compared to what they do now you may deserve it more, but it's not going to happen to you. You have to figure out what all of the rest of your life means. That's yes. a horrifying proposition. Yeah. And that's why all the energy is on a right wing that has an answer to that question. Turn bad into good and turn the, the, the horrors of this thing into a necessary and virtuous cleansing. And then you can continue being a, the same kind of subject you are now with the same spectacular uh, uh, view of politics that you have now. And the same relative ease and comfort and never worry yourself again uh, because you will now have a world where you'll either fall off the beam and it doesn't matter. Or if you stay on it, you get to cheerlead the process of, of 
of, of uh, transformation uh, in its worst and most like formally self-consciously evil uh, manifestation. Yes. One posture is we have to kill everyone even approaching the fence. And then the, uh, the only other posture is being 5,000 miles away from the fence and going, can you believe they're killing all of us at the fence? Yep. That's it. We all got it coming. The rest is just vanity. 